So I think we can uh, get started here. You're uh, here to talk about open source applications with Apache Streams, I take it. So take it away. Hey, everybody. Thanks for being here. And we're off. So I am Steve Blackman. I'm the PMC chair for Apache Streams. Hopefully, there we go. Uh, so my talk is called Open Source Social Applications with Apache Streams. And um, I'm going to work through a number of topics, including a live demo. I've highlighted here um, is the, I guess, is the presentation looking weird to you or just to me? Anybody? Oh, hopefully it will. It's not recovering. So I had hoped to do that in presentation mode, but instead I'm just going to do it in, in notebook mode. So I'm going to, yeah, it still looks funny. I'm going to unshare and share again. This had looked pretty good yesterday in the test room, but not so lucky so far today. So there's a, a number of projects that are going to be um, on display and under discussion. Um, uh, Apache Flink, which is utilized in the demo, Apache Spark, Apache Streams, which is the project that I work on the most, um, Apache Zeppelin, a database binding for Postgres called Postgres. Um, the project that I've been tinkering with um, called Probot, um, a UI framework called React Admin, and a, a commercial UI for Zeppelin called Zeppel. There are link references in this presentation, which I'll uh, make public a little bit later. Um, so the agenda today is to talk about Apache Streams, um, activity streams, the specification, um, the ProBot project. Uh, we'll do a ProBot demo, and then I'll talk about the roadmap for future work on ProBot and on Apache Streams. So starting with activity streams, some of you may have heard of activity streams, probably many of you have not, um, but activity streams is a public specification for describing digital activities and identities. And this goes back to the first iteration um, put together by the W3C Social Web Working Group in 2011. Um, I have a link to that uh, content here for anyone who's interested. Uh, but essentially it described a JSON schema for describing concepts like person, profile, post, share, like the sorts of things that happen on the social web, um, but don't uh, didn't fundamentally at that time have any common representation across different implementations. Um, there was some adoption of Activity Streams 1. Uh, we saw um, Google and Google Plus uh, made attempts to utilize activity streams. Um, the company GNIP later acquired by Twitter and now the backbone of Twitter's commercial data effort um, used activity streams. A number of other uh, networks who were involved um, or who found out about it later also had some activity streams um, interoperability. But in general, the effort uh, failed to achieve widespread adoption among the social data community. Uh, for a number of reasons, which I won't get into. Um, but uh, there was, eventually it was reborn in 2017 as Activity Streams 2.0 uh, uh, as a full W3C recommendation. Um, and in terms of what's different, um, the 2017 iteration um, utilizes JSON-LD, which is a JSON-like variant of RDF resource description framework. What this basically allows is for the activity streams core serialization and language and ontology to be used, but then for the users to bring in other ontologies as well natively through uh, RDF um, interoperability. What that would mean is you could have an act 
you could have a package that contains a post. Your post can, in its kind of core metadata, be based on activity streams 2.0, but then you could also bring through um, information from the um, schema.org ontology, which is very widely used um, on the internet. So basically it's a little more interoperable, a little newer technology and the ability to mix and match different ontologies instead of just being limited to one. And then if that one doesn't meet your need, you have to go outside of the spec without utilizing a different spec. Um, okay, so that's what Activity Streams is. Apache Streams is an open source reference implementation of Activity Streams. Um, so the proposal was first put together in April 2011. I've got the link here. Um, entered the Apache Incubator later in 2011 and then became a top level project in May of 2017. Um, Apache Streams is implemented with uh, Java and Scala. It's available via Maven um, and Docker Hub. Uh, it includes API connectors. It includes a lot of stuff, but it includes API connectors for Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and more. So you can think about one of the activity streams as core features is as a uh, protocol independent kind of bridge for various data sources that contain um, profiles and posts and related information. So you can connect up to those, uh, make, you know, call their API libraries and pull data in, in a normalized form. Um, and it also now has the capability for standardizing the data that come out of those services via data exports. So part of the GDPR data requirement is for data portability. And so what this means is that um, large companies that have data about you that you've put in have to give you a way to pull the data out. Um, which is which is good in theory, but the data that you get from them is unique generally to the data, to however they want to form it, right? They're basically checking a legal box that says that they let you get the data, but the way you get the data and then how useful it is is entirely really not their problem. Um, so Activity Streams now has libraries that can then take those exports and transform the data that you get from them into Activity Streams RDF. Uh, documents um, in the Activity Streams 2 format. Uh, so this is just kind of scratches the surface of Apache Streams, but that's in general um, what it can do. So this talk is open source social applications with Apache Streams. So we'll talk next about Probot, which is basically a personal project for playing with data collected by Activity Streams. Just trying to make sure that my screen is refreshing because I'm not necessarily seeing that it is the way I, yeah, it's so weird. I'm gonna try, I'm gonna try to share the specific window because the sharing of the screen is really gonna be a problem if it doesn't work. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be updating. Okay, uh, so Probot is a personal project for playing with data collected by Apache Streams. Um, I kind of first started it in order to build a prototype Twitter bot using the Twitter account activity endpoint when they were released in 2017. This was kind of the newest feature that the Twitter API added that allowed you to get a live uh, stream of data on your authenticated account, um, including direct messages and to be able to program to send and to send and receive direct messages. So that's where the project started. And I built that and presented it at the Austin Twitter developer group um, in September, 2017. Um, I later expanded it to add basically a user interface for the Twitter data that I was getting through, through that endpoint. Um, and we'll take a look at that interface and see kind of what its current status is and what it can do. Um, and then this year I've been adding basically support to 
browse and navigate through any JSON data that you store in Postgres and basically the capability to configure and run the streams that pull that data in, in Apache Zeppelin notebooks. So that's uh, a lot of what we'll, we'll go through in the demo. Um, and this project very heavily relies on open source API and UI frameworks to minimize blue code. Um, so we'll see there's like, there's not really a custom API layer or UI layer. It's very heavily reliant on frameworks that are flexible enough to, pro to render and uh, browse and play with whatever data we put in them. We can go into more detail about that. Um, and just in general, just at the end with, with whatever time we have, we can kind of circle back and look at various pieces of code of whatever part of this like maybe seems interesting um, to everybody. So I am actually going to tempt fate and try to do this as a live demo. So let me just go ahead and hop over to the front end, which there we go. So this is a, a local instance running and yesterday I basically told it that I wanted to pull in the the tweets, the friends and followers of the Apache con handle. And in a little bit, we'll actually kind of do that and look at what that process looks like. It's really not all that bad. Um, but then having pulled it in essentially, you can see that uh, we get a lot of different details around all of these different um, persons, personas. This actually might be my personal uh, repo and not um, Apache gone, um, but that's totally fine. Um, and the second will, oh yeah, so the tweets here, you can see like this is all tweet data um, from ApacheCon um, as of last night. So I think the latest timestamp should basically be, yeah, yesterday at 9.30 um, when I pulled this down. Um, so we got the content, the metadata, the identifiers um, of both the tweets and of the people that are following and follow this account, right? So. So this is kind of ProBot in a nutshell. It's got this lightweight, low like configuration-based React application on top, a middleware that's uh, getting the data to and from the database, and then a bunch of Apache streams code that's mediated through these notebooks we're about to go through to actually pull the data in. So let's see, let's jump to, uh, so what I'm gonna do right now and Hopefully the demo gods agree. It's kind of walk through this process of pulling in a uh, a new account. So I, I'm gonna pick Apache Zeppelin, which is the project that we're looking at right here. Um, let's try to make it a little bigger so people can a little bit better see. Uh, but this first step is basically we're declaring who the seed user is and making a file um, that's gonna hold that seed user ID and seed user ID.txt. This will be the input to um, a stage that's coming up. So this is actually talking to some Docker containers that's running Apache Flink and interpreting this snippet um, in a second. It should say it's done. Okay, there it goes. I've kind of in the background already told it that this is the, the seed ID for the Apache Zeppelin Twitter account. Okay, so there we go. So that job's done. Took three seconds once it once everything initialized on the Zeppelin side. So next we're going to basically create a new database schema to hold the data we're gonna pull in. So I'm gonna call it Apache Zeppelin because that's the handle we're pulling in. Got to that in a couple places. So there we go. I've created the schema, created the users JSON table, created the tweets JSON table. Make these all public. Okay. And so we're done with that. Um, next up, um, the data that is stored is basically raw JSON data from the stream that comes in. 
Um, so what, what I do in order to make it uh, be formatted just right in the UI is create these views. So this is a view that turns the JSON essentially into, into a table. So create these views in the schema. Okay, so now the database part is basically ready to go. Next up, we will collect the timeline of the user. This basically just means the tweets that they've posted up to the amount that Twitter will let us pull through the API. So what's happening here in this first cell is we're pointing at a, a configuration template that lives in the project and we're passing in a few um, variables, the seed ID being the most pertinent one, and then building a configuration file that's gonna drive the, the Flink job that's gonna run to actually go pull all this data onto the R local file system. We depend in Apache Streams on um, the type safe configuration framework. That's what uh, this stuff is, is binding to right now. It's basically taking the template, swapping in some values that you to provide at runtime, specifically here, the seed ID um, and the working directory, which is unique to my local environment, but configured in the interpreter. Okay, so we have a config file here. This is just kind of a basic sample of what's in it. Um, if anyone's interested in looking at some of this uh, a little bit closer, uh, we can do that in a bit. So here I'm basically launching a Flink job that is gonna pull these tweets in. I believe in one of these tables, I actually have the Flink, here we go. It's already done. Well, that was the one that ran before. Okay. okay, there it goes. So here my Flink Twitter post pipeline is started up and it's basically passing in that seed ID and then running it through um, a series of operations that call the API to pull down. So it pulled 272 posts. I'm gonna assume that's how many posts the Zeppelin account has. Okay, so we now have like on our local file system the JSONs of all of the tweets of the new um, seed account. All right, so next step, we're gonna get the IDs of all of this account's friends. So again, building a config file off of a different template. A new, a new conf, and then that's the conf we're gonna pass in when we run this Flink job called Flink Twitter follower pipeline. Um, the actual Flink jobs that do this are part of Apache Streams. They're checked in under the um, Streams Examples Flink Twitter Collection submodule. Um, if you're interested, just let me know later, and we might have some time to take a look at the code. And you can see right here that uh, we're organizing this data on the file system underneath the seed ID. So however many times we run this with however many different um, accounts as the seed ID, um, we retain the data for all of them. They shouldn't um, step on each other. Okay, so the following pipeline now is gonna kick off. Should see it show up here in a minute. Um, really quickly, for small accounts like this, like you could see that we can work through this entire process in a matter of minutes. For larger accounts that have many followers, what would happen is you would encounter rate limits. Um, so this is already done. Uh, you would encounter rate limits as you pull the data. However, the Twitter connector in Apache Streams already has logic built into it for handling detection of rate limits and then automatic retries. Uh, so the code should be robust to running this on accounts of any size. Although the largest accounts that I've tested it on had about a million um, followers. Okay, great. So, so we've got our friend IDs. We're gonna get follower IDs as well. This is generally for most prominent accounts, the larger data volume. And a quick note on that, we're, we're actually pulling the IDs of the account first and then going to pull the, the data about those accounts 
later as a follow on step uh, because it's far more efficient, especially as the number of users of interest grow. I also suspect that um, some of these steps that are going a little slow would probably be faster if every if everything wasn't in Docker containers running on my laptop. So one thing I aspire to do someday is run a version of this in the cloud on a more powerful hardware and make it available to, um, to the general public to take advantage of and play with. All right, so we're basically running now the same pipeline, but using the follower endpoint instead of the friends endpoint. And the data for that will go into a different file, a different JSONL file sitting on the file system and then be ready to load. Um, after a few more jobs, we'll be ready to load some data in and then take a look at the application as it gets there. All right, so we got 2541 follows, great. Okay, so this is our last collection job. Oops, wrong one, there we go. Oh. And I need that number right here. This one was provided through the form, so. So the, here I have a little spark snippet that's looking at the data that I pulled from the prior two jobs, the followers and the friends, and it's gonna merge those IDs together and distinct them to make sure that we only pull each thing once. And one thing that's really nice about using Zeppelin in this way is that we can seamlessly interweave commands through Spark, through Flink, through, um, through JDBC, so direct commands to Postgres, or any of the other interpreters that are present. All right, so I would expect this to be a couple 2,000 and change, combining the IDs together, 25, six, great. Okay, so now I'm making a configuration to pull the, basically the profiles of all of those 2566 IDs. And I'll note that the, that the notebooks you're looking at here are basically part of the ProBot project. So they're checked in, but like stripped of any con context about like when they last ran. So the idea would be would be that someone could check out ProBot, get the full UI application. It comes with a Docker Compose file that spins up all the infrastructure. And then the, no the Zeppelin deployment that comes up is bound to these notebooks so that basically you could then go through and run all of these steps yourself, build your own local database and have your own local deployment of the application. I wish... I remembered which of these was the, okay, here we go. All right, so this is, so here we go. This is our user information pool. And we're passing in essentially 2566 IDs and it's gonna page through them and bring back full payloads of each one. Shouldn't take too long. Done, okay, great. All right, so we're done pulling data and now we just need to load it up. So let's do that. So what's going on here is we're gonna use Spark to do this. We're gonna pull those JSON files off the disk. Um, that's what this first one's doing. We're doing the tweets first and then we'll do the users. There weren't all that many tweets, if I recall, a couple hundred, but we'll load them nonetheless. All right, we transform them a little bit to put them into the, basically a format that brings their ID and their timestamp outside of the JSON payload. And then it's right here. I'm gonna just make sure that this goes into the right schema. Okay, great, looks like that worked. So now we'll load the users.
very similar to Lawyer Notebook here. We're just pulling from a different source. Yep, 2566, that's familiar. Make sure we put it in the right schema. Users are loaded. Okay, great. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go redirect the Postgres middleware to point at this new schema instead of the one that was up. I'm gonna restart that service and then we should see the Zeppelin data. Uh, in that app. So I'm doing that right now. This is off my screen just because it's in a different app, but no biggie. Okay. I'm Docker composing down the stack, restarting it with that new configuration. So it should be offline, but it's going to come back here in a second. Okay, database is up, API is up. And there we go. So you can see that now we're pulling in the entire tweet history current up till just you know 10 minutes ago for the Apache Apache Zeppelin account. I'll spend just a few more minutes here, kind of like demoing that these fields are sortable, which I like because you can go through and find the posts that have gotten the most traction. Um, from your account. And then when it comes to the users uh, that you follow and follow you, there's quite a bit more um, interactivity. Um, so just on this one as well, we can sort and um, order by kind of whatever we'd like. Uh, but we also can do basically, there's a specific screen name that we want. And, Honestly, I'm not sure if I follow this or not, but I'll find out here in a second. Yeah, so I am a follower of this account, so I'm in this database. Um, so you can do things by screen name that way. You can also search through the bio for a particular field, like who has the word data in their bio. And so everybody in here has the word data in their bio. We can stack these things so I can be like, I wanna know people who have the word data in their bio and have California or Canada, I guess, depending on your context. Yeah, so you see how all of these have the symbol CA. Um, so uh, it's a little bit uh, primitive of a search capability, but it does work. Um, then, you know, adding new filters and adding new fields, as we looked at, basically, you can create the view, pull whatever kind of data you want in whatever way. We could build views that are hybrid, so we could easily add more tables and then join different uh, fields together to, for example, make a table that is only followers, only friends, only retweets as opposed to tweets. Really like with the canvas here provides a lot of flexibility. And so I'm kind of still scratching the surface of different ways to use this. Um, one last thing that I'll just show you real quick, and then I think we'll be ready to go to Q&A um, and talk about the roadmap. So I, I mentioned how we can pull a Twitter archive in or a Facebook archive. So this is an example of the notebook that does that, right? So I have here, like I pulled my Twitter archive um, earlier this month, um, unzipped it. This is the data that comes in a Twitter archive. So we've got just a bunch of little JSON documents of different types, um, all entirely basically proprietary to the way that Twitter wants to feed this data out to you in an archive. Um, I believe that it does use um, to some degree, there is an industry consortium around trying to make data exports interoperable. And it's something that I've been following, although not super closely. So I do believe there's some momentum in that community to make these more interoperable. 
Um, but for my, what I've also seen is I think they're doing that in pursuit of a basically getting permission from various government bodies to make these exports cross portable directly between providers without letting individuals get them, which I feel like is a very negative um, direction to co-opt this if they're able to accomplish it. Um, but what this does is basically can parse through my export and create a bunch of files that look like activity streams containing the content out of my Twitter archive. So one like very practical reason why you might do this um, is say that you have an account that has posted mo way more than a couple thousand times. So Twitter's API limit will only let you pull the last 3,200 posts from any account, including yourself. Um, but if you have this Twitter archive, then you've got in your archive the tweet IDs of up to 10 or 100,000 posts that you've made. With those IDs, we can go run a job from Apache Streams and pull Twitter's current representation of all those tweets um, without regard for that arbitrary um, user timeline limit. Um, okay, so I've been talking a lot and I hope that that demo was interesting to some of you. Uh, let's go ahead and really quickly talk about, so the Probot roadmap. So some stuff I wanna add to this is I wanna add seamless multi-user support. Like you kind of watched the, I had to jump through a couple of hoops in order to pull data about a different user and then look at their data. Um, really like to just be able to basically provide the ID like at login of the user that you wanna look at and have it seamlessly point to the right schema. Um, so that's something that I wanna add. Be able to use OAuth to obtain API tokens. So you wouldn't need to configure your tokens by hand um, as I did in prepping this demo. You could just off the Twitter and then um, you would basically have permission to go pull your data or anyone else's and you could then begin building databases that way. Um, like a feature to let you upload your data archive file directly into the tool versus placing it in the uh, onto the disk in the right place. Again, as I just showed you, I had done. Um, I kind of like to standardize the way that the documents are stored in the database on activity streams format, as opposed to native format and then having um, view bindings that operate on the native format. I like to be able to kind of background job scheduling. So for example, like maybe every night I want to go refresh all the data around my account and just have it ready the next day. That shouldn't be too hard with um, Apache Flink and Apache Zeppelin to figure out how to make that work. Um, and then kind of a little more aspirationally, I'd really like to look at an alternative persistence method. So Postgres with JSON documents is pretty flexible, but like a lot of the activity streams to data is actually more native to RDF. It'd be really nice to figure out how to put the stuff in a, in a graph database using the RDF language directly and then have a GraphQL layer that um, comes with it. There's a couple of graph databases that offer that, um, both RDF support and GraphQL support. And then the UI bind, or the React admin actually does have an open source GraphQL layer that would basically let the front end work the same way, only on a GraphQL backend instead of a Postgres backend. Um, and supporting additional networks, um, pull my Twitter and, or, and my Facebook and Instagram and whatever, YouTube, whatever else data all into the same portal. Um, and in certain cases, basically make it interoperable so I can look at all the profiles that follow me across different networks um, or use cases like that. So Apache Streams, uh, we're, we're talking about kind of what the next steps are for Apache Streams. Activity has been a little slow on the project lately, but we're trying to ramp up to prepare for a 1.0 release. And I, kind of the key things with the 1.0 release would be to actually have a binary release where the jar files that run all of the stuff that I just showed you would exist in, in Maven Central and under publicly accessible Docker containers so that anyone could run them without needing to locally build the code. I feel like that would be huge in terms of making it easier to build apps on top of this, these capabilities. And then some of the ideas that have been floated for like what to focus on after that next release are to kind of fully switch the code base to be built around Apache Streams 2.0 instead of Apache Streams 1.0, which many of the modules still are, um, and to basically support JSON-LD natively, whereas right now it's all native um, 
JSON. Um, we've discussed basically building some Python bindings around the data integration modules. So basically we could have this code base that connects to these different networks. You could use it in Java or Scala or Kotlin through the Maven import, but then if you wanted to code to it in Python instead, you could pull it in through, through PIP. Um, and then I also think it'd be really interesting to look at like having a SaaS app like Probot, basically like the database, the API and the UI that all kind of works together to give you a, an end user experience around your social data inside of the core project. Um, so discussion around like how that might work um, is kind of ongoing and anyone who has thoughts, um, love to hear it. Um, and I'm gonna now go ahead and stop sharing, I guess, and take questions. Um, although if anyone wants to actually do any like looking at under the covers a little more at any of this, that's feel free to ask. All right. Thank you, Stephen, for a nice presentation and nice demo. Actually, I had a question, um, and you were talking about RDF. Have you looked at uh, Apache Jenna or Araya, either one, for the RDF storage or what they can yeah, provide? Yeah. In fact, I gave a talk at Apache Roadshow Chicago in 2019, I think, where I had basically pulled all of my Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube data into Apache Jenna um, and had basically the stock Jenna user experience, um, forget what it's called, but they, there's like a lightweight UI that comes with it. And I was able to Sparkle query um, some of that stuff and kind of browse it as like a unified contact manager. Um, so that presentation I think is, is on YouTube. Um, and yeah, because the, the parts of Apache Streams that produce data that are native Apache Streams 2.0, are it's really easy to take them and I've put the data into, into Jenna, into Stardog, into Allegro Graph and others. And it more or less like just loads. Like actually getting it to do all the processing is a little bit time consuming and not super well documented, but it, it definitely is possible. Um, and I'll note on that, that like one thing that's pretty cool about an approach like that, and this comes back to kind of the federated data piece of this is that if, if I export my social data and put it in my named graph, and then you export your data and put it in a named graph that is in my database or accessible as a uh, basically a remote Sparkle endpoint, then that opens up all kinds of cool stuff you can do to like search for friends that we have in common um, or like query over the geographic footprint of our, of our co-followings or of everyone across our full following. Um, and so I, I do think that it's really interesting not just to like what you can do with your own data, but different applications that can be built on pools of data from people who have been motivated to like pull their data out of the custody of the networks and put it in their own database. I'm looking at the Q and A. Okay, so Brian asked, what drives the search feature you showed? Is that in the React application or is it in the database? Um, Essentially, the React application understands that that little box, I want it to apply to the view using the Postgres-like feature. So like basically any pattern that is compatible with Postgres-like um, will, if you type it in there, it'll evaluate and filter the row set down. Um, there are other filters you can put on that are like a Boolean filter. So I want this specific thing, if and only if some criteria, and you can kind of code up in the the view um, logic, the React view logic, various permutations of that. And as I showed, you can stack different filters on top um, to get super precise down to specific subsets of information, even at pretty large scale. Um, yeah, it's no, because, because it's all based on paging back to the database, um, like to totally easy to have your entire follower base, even if it's in the millions, um, all coexist and get very snappy performance. I think we're, uh, okay, Brian also asks, is there an indexing strategy in the database for dense or high traffic fields in tweets, users, other objects? Uh, sorry, my dog is barking, so this will probably have to be the last question. Um, in the current deployed probot schema and stuff, it doesn't really attempt to impact that. 
However, like as we saw, the the way that the views are created and the way the schema is created is like checked in. So the community could easily start to add additional improvements that cover some of that stuff as we start to like try to run it on accounts that are a little bigger. And with that, I think um, my time is up. So thank you so much for coming. I'm um, I'm Steve, or I'm Matthew Blackman at Apache.org, and I'm Steve Blackman in the uh, streams, I'm uh, sorry, in the Apache Slack.